Our second scripture reading is from Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. And I invite you today to become lay readers and read uh, those verses with me uh, now on the, on the screen. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the water. Let us pray. Lord God, your word is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. We ask you now, illuminate us with your word. Amen. Having a Bachelor of Arts degree uh, in education, the science teacher in me today wants to start with a quiz. I know that's what you all came for, was a quiz today. So uh, any kids here uh, in the room, you can answer too. What, or excuse me, how many planets are there in our solar system? Any answers? I've got nine. I heard eight over here. Eight. Owen? Eight. All right. So it sounds like eight's winning out. All right. Well, eight is the answer. Um, officially, there are only eight planets in our solar system, not nine. Uh, within the last few years, Pluto has been demoted from planet status by the scientists in the know. When I go into a classroom, this question always creates some tensions. Those that think that Pluto is a planet and those that think that Pluto is no longer classified as a planet. No matter if I'm speaking to kindergartners or if I'm speaking to adults, uh, some will always have some very strong opinions on this topic. This is a very simple yet current example of tensions between science and society. These tensions between uh, science, society, or faith are not new. If we go back into history, we see tensions between science and faith going to extremes. Galileo, the 17th century Italian astronomer, was found guilty of heresy and forced to change his beliefs or recant. He was then confined to house arrest. Or kids here in the room, uh, as your parents would say, he was grounded for life. This was all because he believed that the Earth and the planets orbited around the Sun, which in turn orbited around the center of our galaxy. Now, others in his time, with those very same views, lost their lives because of their beliefs. Today, tensions still exist between science, society, and faith. Here's uh, the March 15th uh, National Geographic magazine cover. Notice, the war on science. And if you look closer, you can see some of the topics that they cover in that magazine. During our time this morning, we'll be looking at the tensions that can exist between the disciplines of science and faith, focusing on the, science, uh, or the scientific discipline of astronomy. Tensions between other disciplines of science and faith also exist, but the final conclusion in this sermon is that the same is for all of the sciences. So how, does the, how do the tensions between science and faith impact your life? Is Pluto a planet? Is the Earth less than 10,000 years old? Or is Earth 4.6 billion years old? Did God create the heavens and the earth? Or did it just happen randomly? We're going to tackle the last two questions since they're going to be more relevant for our discussion time. First, for understanding, let's look at Genesis 1 contextually. Genesis 1 was probably written by priests around the time of the Exodus from uh, uh, Egypt and it was a comfort to the Israelites. It was written to a people experiencing their own tensions of leaving their homes with predictable supplies and a somewhat secure slave life that they knew under Pharaoh. From that life, they were thrust into the unknowns of the wilderness with limited access to the necessities of life. It felt like chaos to them. One of the themes uh, for the Israelites to hear in Genesis 1 was that God is in control. He created everything, and out of the chaos of creation will come order. 
we see the idea of God's control stated in Isaiah 45, 18. For the Lord is God, and He created the heavens and earth and put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not to be a place of empty chaos. I am the Lord, He says, and there is no other. Returning to Genesis, it was written in terms that the Israelites could easily understand in that time. Genesis was not meant to be a scientific textbook for the Israelites then, nor is it a scientific textbook for us today. Nowhere does Genesis indicate that water is made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Nowhere does it say that the sun, our sun, is made up of 75% hydrogen and 25% helium and other elements. For that matter, the Bible does not say that there are eight planets in our solar system or nine. Having said that, I want to stress that the Bible is central to who we are as Presbyterians. It's God's word to us today. But the Bible is not a science textbook. It was not meant to be. The Sunspark Labs Vacation Bible School curriculum we're using this June states it well, and I like using this. It says, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly when the beginning was or exactly how God created everything. It just says he did it. Let's move forward and look at some of the tensions we experience as followers of Christ living in a science-oriented world. As we look at science and faith in our world, there are sisters and brothers in faith who read Genesis 1 as saying, the universe was created in six 24-hour periods, and on the seventh day, God rested. For them, the earth is less than 10,000 years old. Then there are sisters and brothers in faith that believe Earth is 4.6 billion years old and created by God over a long period of time and that the universe is 13.7 billion years old, more or less with a small margin of error. Small. Beliefs of society and the church were being tested in the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries by a new understanding of the mechanism of God's creation through Copernicus, Bruno, Galileo, and others. Our beliefs are also being tested by a new understanding of the mechanisms at work in God's creation. For some, these new scientific findings threaten the integrity of the Bible. For instance, if the Bible is the Word of God and authoritative, how can the statement Earth is 4.6 billion years old, or that there could be life on moons in our solar system coexist with our biblical understanding. We must remember that our understanding of God's creation is incomplete. Scientists will tell us that they do not have all the answers in regard to how the universe came about and the makeup of our universe. Questions still exist. What is the universe made of? What is causing the galaxies to move outward and the universe to expand? I have questions about Genesis 1. Here are just a couple. In Genesis 1, verse 16, how did God create the stars? Did God simply speak and the billions and billions of stars simply come into being all at once? Or did God arrange all the hydrogen atoms in each star over a period of time? Science itself is a gift and a tool that advances our knowledge of God's awesome creation. Captain Jeffords Scorey, the head of the U.S. Episcopal Church, says this, Episcopalians understand the life of the mind is a gift of God, and to deny the best of current knowledge is not using the gifts God has given you. Can we extend that to Presbyterians? I think so. In the beginning, God gave Adam and Eve the gift of knowledge about the world, the plants and the animals around them. Just as Catherine Scorey says that God has given us the gift of knowledge today. 
Can we imagine Adam and Eve's lives as a teachable moment with God as teacher and Adam and Eve as students? Friends, the sciences or sciences are a gift given at creation by our Creator so that we may better understand this most awesome universe. From that gift of science, we're able to see some agreement between the biblical account of creation and the scientific account. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, which you just read a few moments ago, says that the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. The word void in Hebrew is tohu, meaning formless, confusion, emptiness. Science tells us that in the beginning of our universe, there was nothing emptiness. And within an instant, there was something, a single pinpoint, which expanded rapidly into a vast formless cloud of chaotic radiation. Tohu! In the last century of astronomy, with the advent of larger and larger telescopes, and new space-based telescopes such as Hubble, our understanding of God's creation has changed dramatically. We now know that many of those tiny dots of light that Abraham or the shepherds saw so long ago in the night sky were just a few of the billions of galaxies in our universe, and within those galaxies, billions and billions of stars. Some of the deep space images we now see of our universe were taken from Hubble, and in my view, the artwork of God's creation. On the screen here a moment, you'll see uh, about six different pictures taken from Hubble of objects, deep space objects, in our universe. And again, to me, these are pieces of artwork. See the smiley face? <laughs> if you want to talk about that, catch me later. That's interesting. That is a dying star that shed its atmosphere and blasted off and gave these great, wonderful colors. The Orion Nebula, it takes light 24 years to cross it. Light left to make that picture 1,500 years ago. The Trifid, the colors are just awesome. Again, artwork. This next picture is the official title is the hand of God. Can you see a hand there? That's a nebula, a cloud of gas in space. With all our human knowledge, we still do not have a complete understanding of God's creative process, whether from a biblical perspective or a scientific perspective. In his book, Coming to Peace with Science, Dr. Darrell Falk, a professor of biology at Point Loma Nazarene University, says the following. Bible scholars, even conservative ones, are agreed that the Bible uses poetic language on occasion and must not always be taken literally. Scholars are also agreed that God spoke through the culture of the day. God communicates in a manner that enables people to understand. The great church reformer John Calvin stated that God uses the equivalent of baby talk so that God's people could understand what he had to say. The message of Scripture has always been that God comes to us wherever we are, in our naivete, and relates to us in terms that we, despite our vast ignorance, can understand. Now, Calvin's actual words uh, referring to baby talk comes from his institutes, and it's stated this way, as nurses commonly do with infants, God is wont in measure to lisp in speaking to us. Baby talk. After hearing Dr. Falk speak during a workshop at Whitworth a few years ago, I came away with this perspective. Respect our sisters and brothers, even though our ideas on creation may not be in agreement. Believing in a young earth or believing in a very old earth is not heresy. The main thing is that we hold on to our relationship with God no matter where our beliefs are on creation and science. Taking another look at the text of Genesis 1, we find that throughout 34 verses of the creation story, God is doing something in each verse. God is in action, and God is in control. 
For us today, it's important that we hear from SunSpark Labs, VBS, and from Genesis. The tensions of the how of creation in those 34 verses is far less important than the who of creation. Who is control in control of the chaos of our lives? Which brings us back to where we started this sermon. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created. 